Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to the virtual event, Transforming Food Systems for Better Nutrition, Health, and Prosperity for All, organized by the UN Food System Summit Secretariat in support of the Tokyo Nutrition for Growth, NFG Summit. Uh, my name is Lawrence Haddad. I'm the Executive Director of GAIN and the former Chair of Action Track One, focusing on ensuring access to safe and nutritious food for all. Now, colleagues, malnutrition in all its forms affects one in three people directly, and in fact, affects every person on this planet. Every one of us listening in today, we all know somebody who is malnourished. And in fact, several of us listening in today may be malnourished in one way or another, as strange as that may seem. In its most severe forms, malnutrition prevents the body and mind from developing and systematically dismantles what is left. At the center of all forms of malnutrition is food. Not enough food, not enough of the right type of food, or too much of the wrong type. Transforming our food systems can be a massive game changer for nourishing people, planet, and prosperity. So our goal today is to figure out how the alliances, coalitions, and initiatives created and unleashed by the UN Food System Summit can be leveraged to drive acceleration in nutrition improvement via the n for g and beyond. And there are many of these initiatives to draw inspiration from. There's the Wasting Reset, the Anemia Alliance, Act for Food, Act for Change Youth Campaign, the Healthy Diet Coalition, and the Aquatic and Blue Foods Coalition, to name a few. Now, the event is divided into four parts. The first part is a context setting opening by the UN Food System Summit Special Envoy, Dr. Agnes Kalapata, and our representative from the, US, from the government of Japan and n for g The second part is, is a moderated panel discussion. The third part is a Q&A session moderated with the audience. And the fourth and final part is the concluding remarks by the chair of the Committee on World Food Security regarding the way forward. Before we start, I want to draw your attention to the following logistics. Uh, participants are welcome to introduce themselves in the chat box. Uh, given that due to a large number of attendees, this event is not set up as a meeting, but it is a webinar. Um, we kindly ask you to post your questions in the Q&A box where all panelists and attendees can see them. And we'll be monitoring this section and we'll try our best to answer all questions raised and to select a couple of questions to be answered verbally by the panel in the Q&A session. And because of the limited capacity, we can only take questions that are posted in English in the Q&A box on Zoom. But, but please note, all the presenters will, will speak in English, but there will be simultaneous translation into Arabic, Chinese, French, Japanese, Russian, and Spanish. And a big thank you to all of our interpreters. And you can select the language through the translation button on the bottom of your screen. So without further ado, let's get started by first calling on the UN Food System Special Envoy for the summit, Dr. Agnes Kalabata, for her opening remarks. Agnes, over to you. Thank you, Lawrence, and really good to see you again after um, we had a great summit, uh, two years, uh, really 20 months of uh, great work and really great working with you, uh, Lawrence and the other colleagues in Action Trucks. I want to take, <coughs> excuse me, I want to take the, this moment also to welcome everyone uh, that is participating here today. We are hosting this virtual summit as Lawrence has said, uh, in support of the Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit, which is starting, uh, taking place tomorrow, tomorrow. You might call this the Cut and Razor Summit, really recognizing that there's a huge link between the Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit and the, World Food, and the Food System Summit that we just had. And a mutual recognition that nutrition in all its forms is one of the biggest challenges that we face today uh, to ensuring optimal health. It's also a challenge to ensure resilience of people, prosperity, and sustainable food systems. 
I want to start by commending the strong leadership of the government of Japan. We've seen over 63 national dialogues taking place uh, to ensure that the Japanese government and its people understand what is at stake from a food systems perspective. I follow you, I've watched CNN and BBC and all the, the information you're putting out there to mobilize not just your people, but also the rest of the world. And I just want you to know that your leadership is greatly appreciated and the support uh, to the Food Systems Summit is also hugely appreciated. With the UN Food Systems Summit behind us and now the Total Nutrition for Growth um, coming on its heels, we need to ensure that there's a strong linkage between the two summits, <clears throat> that the outcomes of the two and the nutrition agenda remain at the center of the food systems transformation even as we go forward. I want to call out a number of observations coming from the food system summit that I think are very critical to helping you understand how critical this is to everyone. Nourishing all people, uh, which was a major area of the uh, Nutrition for Growth Summit, I mean, sorry, of the Food System Summit and the top priority for the Secretary General is an area that a number of governments called out from uh, calling out zero hunger, 65 countries called out uh, an end to zero hunger in their statements. Um, uh, 60 countries called out for nutrition and health diets and 43 countries called out a need for, uh, for uh, healthy school feeding, uh, recognizing that over 320 million school children have lost access to school feeding. We also know that from uh, our action, uh, for the work behind the coalition that came from <clears throat> many of the action tracks and the 230 stakeholder initiatives that were then later launched have highlighted a number of coalitions, the Zero Hunger Coalition being one of the most important with a huge support from the private sector. Thanks to your efforts, Lawrence, over 350 million now mobilized to support uh, from private sectors to support that Zero Hunger Initiative, health diets, school meals, blue food, and so many other initiatives were launched, again, in recognition of the importance of health, diets, and nutrition in general. But the scientific group also did put out a number of papers and those papers are available for everyone to see and to read. And most, most important, I might call out the definition of healthy diets because that's an, an area that we needed uh, really landed as we were going to the summit, sustainable consumption patterns, shift to healthy, sorry, shift to health, healthy and sustainable consumption patterns and many other papers that are uh, including access to safe and nutritious food that are all available <clears throat> on, on our, our UN Food Systems portal and the scientific groups portal uh, available for reading for, and consultation. So another thing that I would like to call out that is extremely important is just the link uh, to, to the whole idea of uh, nutrients and, and, and the inability for communities that are already struggling to access the right level of nutrients, the link we must make, especially because it affects the most vulnerable among us, it affects children, but also because going to the Nutrition for Growth Summit, we want to see some of these areas addressed deeper. We want to, have, we want to see more opportunities around going deeper into some of these areas. Just to take something like how we changed the world, how the world changed when iodine was added to salt and how cognitive capacity improved by 15 points in that, by doing that alone. But there are so many people around the world that still don't have access to that. And that is something that is within our means. All the challenge around iron and how anemia and children and, and, and mothers is, is still a major problem. <clears throat> but also we know that iron and zinc cause cognitive, uh, permanent cognitive damage in children. And these are things that are reversible. I mean, are irreversible. But let's also remember why we went to the Food System Summit. The Secretary General said that the solutions to our current problems, we already have answers to those solutions, to those problems, we already have the solutions. So here, one of the things that we really need to double down on, at least in the, for me, in, in the work that I do every day, just recognizing that some of these things that can be fixed, some of the solutions that live into, in our midst and are not available to people is something that is not acceptable. 
fortification and by fortification are things now we know for that have been around for, for, for a long time and there are things that we need to double down on and ensure that policies that support fortification and by fortification and policies that support investments in fortification and by fortification uh, be become available so that there are no communities out there that are sitting outside uh, fulfilling their capacity as human beings because they didn't have access to the right nutrients. So as we go into the food, the Nutrition for Growth Summit uh, this week, I want um, the, the, the community behind the Nutrition for Growth Summit to know, I want Japan to know, and everybody that is involved in this, this to know the Food System Summit is behind you and we are supporting you in every way and we'll ensure that nutrition, healthy diets as called out by all young people of the world, these are things that are going to have to be at the center of our food systems going forward. And we look forward to continue working with you on that. We look forward to continue advocating for this agenda and we look forward to ensuring that we can fulfill this in the 2030 agenda as required, requested by uh, the Secretary General. So thank you all for being part of this meeting. I look forward to this meeting itself and its outcomes and I look forward to being part and all of us being part of the upcoming Nutrition for Growth Summit tomorrow uh, so that we can understand the challenges but also the opportunities in our Mideast. Thank you, Lawrence, again for moderating this meeting. And I look forward to working with you uh, on the ground uh, to making some of these things a reality. Over to you, Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Special Envoy, for those remarks. So we, you're quite right. We need to make sure there's a very strong link between these two summits outcomes and, and the nutrition agenda needs to remain at the center of food system transformation. I think as you implied, uh, Agnes, we need to nourish the future as well as feed it. So let's hear from now the government of Japan uh, who have been leading this year's Nutrition for Growth Summit to get the latest updates and highlights of the n for g Summit, which is tomorrow, uh, and the linkages with the UN Food System Summit. And we're joined today by video by Mr. Hara Keiichi, the Deputy Director General and Deputy Assistant Minister in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And the Deputy Director General will provide an overview of the key updates and highlights of the coming n for g Summit with focus on its linkages to the UNFSS. Over to you. Hi, Excellency Dr. Agnes Karibata, Special Envoy for the 2021 Food Systems Summit, distinguished guests and colleagues. I wish to express my gratitude to the UN Food Systems Summit Secretariat for giving me the opportunity to join you today for this important official side event of the Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit 2021, transforming food systems for better nutrition, health, and prosperity for all. Around the world, one in every 10 people suffers from hunger and undernutrition. Why? one in every three is overweight or obese. The entire world is facing this double burden of malnutrition, where we see the coexistence of undernutrition that hinders growth and overnutrition that causes nutrition-related non-communicable diseases. Furthermore, with the worsening of malnutrition due to the pandemic, and the rising number of people experiencing hunger, addressing issues related to nutrition is more important than ever. It is time to tackle nutritional uh, challenges in both resource limited and high income countries by taking the multi sectoral approach. Nutrition related issues have been treated in the health sector from the perspective of supporting human health. In recent years, however, there has been growing awareness that the benefits of improving the nutritional status of people will not be maximized without improving the food systems, including agriculture and the food industry, which affect the quality of foods that people actually consume. 
following the outcome of the UN Food Systems Summit, the Tokyo N4G Summit will welcome nutrition-related uh, commitments, including those linked to food, health, and social protection systems at the capstone moment in December 2021. The Tokyo N4G is a pivotal opportunity to renew political and social momentum, mobilize additional funding, and accelerate action for ending all forms of malnutrition. The secretariats of both the UN Food Systems Summit and the Tokyo N4G Summit have worked together to avoid duplication and to produce synergy and developed a joint statement which has been published on both websites. The UN Food Systems Summit and the Tokyo N4G Summit are working collaboratively to advance solutions across systems with mutual recognition that malnutrition in all its forms is one of the biggest challenges we face to ensuring optimal health, resilience, and prosperity for all. To further highlight the importance of this issue, a Nutrition for Growth Year of Action was launched in December 2020. The UN Food Systems Summit and the Tokyo N4G Summit present a unique opportunity to address both the immediate and underlying causes of malnutrition. The government of Japan sets five priority areas for the summit, composed of three pillars and two cross-cutting components. This comprehensive approach will help us achieve the global targets and best end malnutrition in all its forms. The first pillar is health. This pillar focuses on making nutrition integral to universal health coverage for sustainable development. The second is the diet, which focuses on building food systems that promote safe, healthy diets and nutrition ensuring livelihoods of producers and climate smart. The third pillar is on resilience, focusing on addressing malnutrition in fragile and conflict affected contexts. In these contexts, there is a critical need for multi-year nutrition policies and plans with targets. These three pillars are supported by data-driven accountability as well as new investment and innovative nutrition financing. Regarding making commitments, we provide a comprehensive commitment guide for all stakeholders. It gives you concrete guidance on how to develop a commitment, which is guided by the specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound criteria. The application of those criteria ensure that the commitments such as financial policy or impact, their goals and their expected outcomes are clearly articulated. This makes commitments easier to classify and monitor and makes it possible to measure impact and demonstrate success. I believe today's session will bring good and well-balanced nutrition to millions of more people worldwide by ensuring mobilizing cross-sector support around advancing food systems transformation. I look forward to welcoming you to the Tokyo N4G Summit from tomorrow for two days with your ambitious commitments to fight all forms of malnutrition. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your remarks, Deputy Director General. And your remarks remind us how central nutrition is to all of those work streams, health, food systems and healthy diets, resilience, data-driven accountability, and finance. Nutrition has the potential to pull all of those communities together, and we must actually seize that opportunity and make that a reality. Now, um, let me invite our guests uh, a panelist to take the virtual floor and join me for the next discussion. We have a diverse set of panelists joining us. 
the speaker bios are at the uh, are, are available in the uh, briefing note, which will be shared with you in the chat box. Um, the panelists come from member states, civil society, uh, youth uh, movements, SMEs, producers, indigenous peoples. Uh, it's a wide range of, of uh, constituencies that are represented today. Specifically, let me introduce them briefly now. We have Dr. Tanya Martinez-Cruz, who is uh, a researcher uh, in, on indigenous peoples and from indigenous peoples. Welcome, Tanya. We have Mr. Tom Arnold, who is Ireland's Special Envoy on Food Systems. Welcome, Tom. Dr. Ferro Lemma, who is the Senior Advisor for the Office of the Minister of Health in Ethiopia's ministry, Federal Ministry of Health. Welcome, Ferru. Uh, Ms. Sophie Healy Tao, who is the co-chair of the Youth Liaison Group for the UN Food System Summit process. Welcome, Sophie. Uh, Ms. Kadja Mohammed Churchill, who is the founder of Kwanzaa Tukule Foods, which is a food SME delivering safe and nutritious food in low-income urban areas in Kenya. Welcome, uh, Kadja. Uh, Ms. Rima uh, Nanavati, who is the Ag Director of the Self-Employed Women's Association, also known as SEWA, who represents uh, producers. Welcome, Rima. And Ms. Carolina Turagio, who is the Alliances and Advocacy Lead of Fondacion Exito of Colombia as our civil society representative. All of these panelists are live except for uh, Carolina from Colombia. And because of uh, time zone constraints, she is joining us through a pre-recording. So I suggest we start hearing from uh, Miss Carolina, uh, and then we will move on to the live panel. So over to the video from Carolina. Thank you, Dr. Haddad, and hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure for the Latin American, the Caribbean Civil Society Network of the Sun Movement to have received this invitation. Well, we consider that health and nutrition must be intrinsic to food systems if we really want to have an impact. An understanding of food systems focused on production, consumption and disposal is incomplete. A complete understanding must include measures that will reduce malnutrition, starting with the promotion of breastfeeding and compliance with the International Code of Marketing of Breast Milk Substitutes, and also moving to healthy lifestyles and nutrition education. How various sectors can advance the agenda has already been answered by the Food System Summit and will be addressed again in N4G. We know it is the articulation of all sectors and the combination of their strengths, their resources, based on a genuine commitment to end malnutrition, plus an agreed upon, plausible and well-funded action plan. This is not a new idea, but putting it into practice remains a challenge. To include nutrition in Latin American food systems, organizations from the Sun Civil Society Network in El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, Costa Rica, Ecuador, Peru and Colombia advocate cross-sector coordination and participation of all sectors while simultaneously conducting and disseminating research and participating in the formulation of proposals that contribute to health and nutrition policies and programs. Costa Rica provides an example of our work and field. Through their National Plan for Sustainable and Healthy Gastronomy, led by civil society, they have coordinated more than 50 entities from among government agencies, academia, food producers, restaurants, and tourism. In the Canton of San Ramon, they articulate clean production, innovation with local products, marketing, healthy consumption, gastronomy, and tourism, impacting more than 100,000 people. To overcome challenges and accelerate actions around health and nutrition integrated within food systems, we emphasize four key actions. First, to align administrative logic across many sectors to produce agile and effective alliances. To implement existing governmental policies and commitments to food systems, health and nutrition by promptly funding them and taking concrete and measurable actions. To implement shock plans to close gaps in the provision of health and nutrition service widened by pandemic care as well as gaps in the acquisitive capacity of households. 
And, and lastly, provide institutional incent incentives for good practices and disincentives for practices that promote poor nutrition. These incentives should not widen inequality. Finally, our commitment as Sun Civil Society Network in Latin America and the Caribbean is to collect the agreements of our states in the Food Systems Summit and in N4G, to accompany the implementation of national roadmaps, to follow up commitments using the Nutrition Accountability Framework to ensure multi-sectoral interventions, and finally, to advocate that every new government maintains continuity of its country's commitments in times of transition. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Carolina. That was uh, fab fabulous. You know that the um, the government of Colombia is is a real leader in this space, and I loved I loved the focus on aligning resources on data driven accountability and really critically the continuity of regimes from one government to another. So often nutrition gets um, lost in the transition and falls between the stools of the two. Two governments. So that's that's absolutely brilliant. Now, panelists, um, don't want to put any pressure on you, but we've got over 400 people um, listening in. So you have a great platform to tell us what you want to tell us. Um, we don't have with us um, uh, Kajia, our um, SME representative. So I'm hoping she will join us later. If she doesn't, we will we'll, uh, work around that. But uh, first of all, I'm going to start with you, Sophie. Uh, and Sophie, let me let me start by asking you, you know, from your perspective, um, you've been leading uh, lots of lots of initiatives from a, from a youth perspective. Uh, but from your perspective, what do you see as the big wins from the UN Food System Summit that the Nutrition for Growth Summit must capitalize on? Over to you, Sophie. Thank you so much, Lawrence, and thank you so much for having me here. Um, I guess if there are a few big wins uh, from the UN Food System Summit that should be carried over, not just into N4G, but into all other um, big events coming up in the next year. The first one I'd have to say is youth engagement. The UN Food System Summit held youth engagement um, as, a, as a core engagement, equal to other stakeholder engagements, which hasn't been seen before, and I haven't felt as a young person before, quite as significant as the UN Food System Summit process. The UN Food System Summit had young people engaged from the beginning, from the creation of the UN Food System Summit, through youth co-chairs of um, the, the, um, the groups, and also the UN Food System Summit gave young people a space to create an engagement process which worked for us through the creation of the Youth Liaisons Group, which was our direct connection to the UN Food System Summit Secretariat. And the UN Food System Summit also helped support the creation of new youth engagement processes and youth organizations, such as the Act for Food, Act for Change campaign. The second learning I'd have to say is the systems thinking approach. And the systems thinking approach we hadn't seen um, really before at a UN space. Um, it kind of taught not only um, people and stakeholders and young people um, that one decision links and is directly connected to another, but it also reached out into the public domain and made people realize that they were part of a system which can really change the world if we put our minds to it. And that leads me to my third um, big win or big learning is that everybody was part of the conversation. The UN Food System Summit went out into the public and held dialogues, whether people were online or offline. And this is something that the nutrition sector really needs to do, reach out into people's spaces and connect and have conversations with them. And number four, a little bit of outrage goes quite a long way. I don't see the outrage behind uh, nutrition and malnutrition yet, especially when it comes to public discourse, discourse and public um, conversation. I mean, as you mentioned, Lawrence, uh, malnutrition affects one in three people worldwide. Um, and Agnes Kalabata said it is 
one of the biggest challenges that we're facing as a globe right now. It prevents the body and mind from developing and nutrition really needs to be taken seriously. And we saw a little bit of outrage come out from the UN Food System Summit about the degradation of our food systems. We need to see that same outrage come behind nutrition also. Thank you. Sophie, thank you. Youth, uh, systems thinking, everybody was part of the conversation and I love a little bit of outrage goes a long way and I would certainly uh, vouch for that. It needs, we need, we need more outrage. It needs to be constructive. It needs to be channeled, but we need the outrage. Without that, we are just complacent and, and sleepwalking into a situation where not only do we have one in three people malnourished, we could easily have one in two. Thank you for that, Sophie. Uh, Farou, for as long as I've known you, you've been a relentless advocate for nutrition in your country, Ethiopia, and beyond. Uh, how will these two summits help you with your work in the Federal Ministry of Health, Farou? Uh, thank you, Lawrence. Hello, everybody. I think uh, as a background, I think Ethiopia has a, has a rich policy environment in terms of agriculture and nutrition. Uh, particularly recent ones are the food and nutrition policy we had and uh, a new food and nutrition strategy launched in August. Uh, we also have a nutrition sensitive agriculture, uh, social productive safety net program, or social protection program, and all these are within, included within the national development plan. And these are the 10 year plans which uh, just came up recently. We also have development partners who have been working with the intention to contribute to our nutrition goals. And I think a good example we had was, is the Sokota Declaration, where the government process has been going on and there is a big buy-in or commitment, not only from the government, but also from a lot of development partners, as well as uh, regional or subnational uh, states and uh, communities, uh, which is an example and which is being expanded now. And I think during the Ethiopian food system process, we had followed the strong sort of capacity strengthening perspective and uh, which was actually extensive involvement of our donors, the UN agencies, the civil society or the Ethiopian uh, coalition for uh, of the civil society organizations at the, the Sun academias and some private sector, particularly represented by the business network and these, and they were also part of our technical group, which is under the curators in the food system process. And that led us to bring out a, a strong, uh, for it to be a strong outcome, which is, which I'm quite proud of what we have in terms of the transformation path we have submitted and developed. And I think going forward, we, I think we see what we must have is, we need to identify the space and the source of uh, engage more youth groups, uh, which we didn't do, and as well as various types of particularly the private sector. And we have also to guard against the, uh, which has, we have, this has brought us together and we need to guard ourselves to, from jumping back to silos because both I think nationally, as well as I think globally, we need to continue these elements the food system has brought together in terms of various stakeholders and even communities. And I think my wish is that the work we have done for the food system, as well as our nutrition for growth commitments, will align our existing efforts on the way to implement the multi-policy instruments to take a strong food system perspective, but also can help us enhance the synergies and accelerate our momentum. And I'm saying this because we are having a very important goal to achieve in the 10 year national development plan as a priority goal. One of the main priority goals is zero stunting in under two and stunting uh, in under five reduced 13% in the next 10 years. And I think this in terms of the Ministry of Health and myself, we would like to look at the, the commitments we have aligned with the healthy diet center the approach so that it could take us to forward it from different parts of the food system. And this, for this reason, the Ministry of Health is looking at how we could leverage our healthy diet coalition to help us or our food system access to identify the unique entry points and align our commitments to for a positive momentum of the food system transformation, as well as attain our N4G commitments. 
And for this, I think we already have the Sokota Declaration, which is expanding to almost 250 districts. And it's one of the game-changing solutions, both in our UN uh, Food Utopian Food System Transformation Plan, as well as our Nutrition for Growth Commitment. So we are ready to go, and we hope we will see all our colleagues to in, in going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Faru. Um, wow, ambitious goals um, embedded in national development plans, nutrition, that doesn't always happen and in investments and in capacity on the ground to make sure implementation happens. Often we get stuck with the aspirational goals and the plans, but we don't invest in the capacity. Government of Ethiopia is, is clearly not um, resting on its laurels when it comes to nutrition. Uh, I like the fact that you acknowledge that uh, there are things to learn from the summit. Uh, engage youth more from the UN Food System Summit, engage youth more, engage private sector in uh, maybe smarter ways. And uh, I loved your advice to everybody, uh, avoid jumping back into the silos. It's so easy to do that and we must resist it. And finally, uh, as someone who's uh, engaged in the Healthy Diets Coalition process, I can only say for you that the Healthy Diets Coalition is ready and willing to support the government of Ethiopia in implementing its transformation pathway. So please do contact me or, or, or Nancy Alberto or Francesco Branca uh, on, on that. Um, let me now turn to Tanya. Tanya, uh, in, Indigenous peoples were the first tillers of the soil and harvesters of the oceans. Their, their knowledge is deep and grounded, but it's not always taken into account. And they frequently don't have a seat at the table. Uh, despite being frequently the most vulnerable to malnutrition. So how can, how can Indigenous peoples make their voices heard on nutrition and how can these summits help? Over to you. Thank you very much for the invitation and for that question. I'm going to start with some examples before, then I will move to answer your, your question straight away. So uh, to start, I would like to make a distinction when we talk about indigenous people's food systems compared to other systems, because that's a question that we get frequently, uh, we need to uh, think of, of, of gathering too. It's not only about a farming in the conventional way, but also that we have communities that are a gatherers, a fishers and hunters, etc. And why is this relevant? In the context of COP26, the climate crisis and just the UNA Food System Summit, it's quite frequently to hear that the 80% of the world's biodiversity is kept by indigenous peoples in less than 25% of the world's planet. So indigenous peoples do not get food in the conventional way, but they also have a holistic way of understanding and that's why territories become such a crucial point. Um, let me give you now also another example, and then I will come to, to, to answer your question finally. Uh, when we talk about nutrition and food security, me as a practitioner, many times we think of a interventions and programs and pushing and shaping people's preferences in, in their diets, but rarely we sit and try to understand from them. I love this example from an indigenous leader I met several months ago, and he said, to me, let's call that leader Pedro. Pedro told me that he met the Minister of Development of his country and he took with him some of the sacred worms of his community, like a gift to the minister. When he placed them on the table, the minister screamed and she was like, what do you want me to do with these worms? And he said, well, I'm, I'm offering them you them, them to you as a present, but also for you to understand that when you shape diets and make interventions that do not consider our preferences, our ways of living, this is how we feel. So um, what I want to, what I want to, or the conclusion I want to make with all these points and arguments is like, we need to ensure to start if we think about territories, biodiversity, and the well-being of the planet, but also respecting the rights of indigenous peoples, we need to ensure that the rights to self-determination, ways of governance, and territories are ensured. Secondly, we need to think about intercultural policies, food, agriculture, education, medicine. I love asking people when I talk about interculturality, for example, for those of us that speak several languages, a, if we feel some limitations when we cannot express ourselves in a given language, or when we talk about food like Pedro, 
uh, if we have eaten something that we don't like when we travel, but we have to eat it because we don't have so many options. So if we want to ensure that they have a seat at the table, um, a, we need to ensure that we can build intercultural policies, but at the same time, that we are a reinforcing them and, and supporting them in the ways uh, they can achieve those places. And one example for me, if you were asking the previous speakers, what's something that they gain from events like this? I think for me, what I gain from events like this, just thinking of the summit, just thinking about COP26, is the capacity to build networks with peoples around the world, because I believe that if we want to make changes, those changes also have to emerge from people. And for me, that's one of the wins. A, at the Global Hub of Indigenous Peoples at FAO, a, which is, uh, a, or let's say, brings together a 20 different organizations around the world, which includes scientists, a, includes indigenous peoples, includes policymakers. Uh, we are trying to gather evidence because one of the critical questions we get when we want to portray indigenous knowledge as something crucial is where is the evidence for what you propose in works because knowledge systems work recently and I would like to invite you we've recently published as part of the global hub a, um, a paper on hierarchies of knowledge and the importance to, to think of other ways of producing knowledge. Um, which was uh, built or, or written collectively as part of the Global Hub, but also we drafted as part of the UNA Food Systems a WIPALA paper that uh, basically uh, brought together different experiences from people around the world. And it was a paper that was accepted by the UNA uh, scientific group, which for us was really rich and also served to us in a way with the endorsement of different governments like Canada, Dominican Republic, Finland, New Zealand, Norway, and Spain, Mexico, sorry, it's my country and I'm forgetting my country, uh, the support of the UNA Permanent Forum on Indigenous Peoples and other key actors to build this coalition on Indigenous Peoples. Uh, we have the coalition, but it's still we have indigenous peoples living in 90 countries around the world. I would invite many other actors that want to contribute, many other countries that want to contribute to our mission and work to a common work with us. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Um, thank you for reminding us it's about gathering and, and hunting as well. Thank you for bringing in COP26, uh, which I needed to have brought in. It's an important link in the chain between UNFSS and NFG. Uh, thank you for also reminding us um, that we need to, um, we can't walk in the shoes of indigenous peoples. Sometimes they don't even have shoes, but we can't walk in their shoes very easily, but we have to think really hard about their perspectives and think about things from their perspectives. And the intercultural nature of policies uh, is one thing that uh, those of us who are not part of indigenous peoples groups can can do to support them um, and I think I think your point about networking and building networks out of the summits is really important I think that's true for everyone but it's I think it's especially true for groups that uh, maybe don't have an, as much power as some of the other groups and I, I really applaud your work on building evidence because I'm also I'm a big believer in the need to integrate uh, more formal scientific evidence with more experiential tacit knowledge. And I think building evidence in different ways is a really important thing to do. So thank you for all of those reminders and uh, insights. Uh, Rima, we have, um, I think it's over to you now, Rima. Uh, Sewa is uh, 1.5 million Indian women strong. It's probably more than that. Um, it focuses on, on worker rights and well-being throughout the economy. And without SEWA, it seems to me that your members' voice and contributions would be much more invisible than they currently are. You give them voice and fight for their rights. How can SEWA do more to fight for the food and nutrition rights of your members? And how can these two summits and the COP, how can they help you do that? Over to you. Thank you so much, Lawrence, for asking this very, very important question. And I think uh, we at SEVA organize around 1.9 million uh, women workers in the informal sector. And uh, as you rightly said, the main task is to give voice and visibility to, um, to these uh, workers, their work. 
And I think we at Seva strongly believe that the food system in itself forms a circular economy uh, with the informal sector women workers involved at each and every stage. And for the workers involved in such integrated food system, access to food is a basic right. And therefore, food security is also a human right for them. So this therefore, you know, automatically calls for decent work and living income for these workers. Um, so I, and the women shoulder around almost 65% of responsibilities in the food systems. This includes the producers, the distributors, the sellers, the cooks, the consumers, as well as the waste and garbage recyclers. Um, Seva's almost five decades of experience has shown that when women have access to work and income security, food security, and access to health care, nutrition, and insur insurance, it ensures full employment to these workers, uh, leading to economic empowerment of these uh, workers in the food system. And therefore, I think uh, what is really very important is that how do you build uh, or organize women own, women's own collectives where women are not just as agriculture workers or small farmers, but they are also the owners and managers of the uh, food, um, you know, agribusiness agro and food processing, because that's the nexus. And I think very important is that how do women own grain banks? How do women own seed banks? And how do we bring back the traditional coarse grains back into circulation? And that is very important to ensure that women not only have food security, but it ensures better nutrition um, to women and girls as well. Uh, the other important aspect that I think uh, is, you know, and I think as Tanya or uh, I think the uh, uh, Dr. Ferru also brought in the whole climate um, uh, issue as well. So that, you know, we have seen that COVID has destroyed the livelihoods of these informal sector workers, which has led to direct reduction in food intake. But not only that, even the climate shocks. And therefore, building climate resilience of women workers in the food system. And I think what is very, very important and pressing is to set up an agriculture livelihood recovery and resilience fund for the women in the food system. Uh, last and the very important aspect is that, you know, our experience has shown that local decentralized supply chains where women are the owners and the managers, which work on local production, local procurement, function far more better in providing doorstep food and nutrition to the women, um, to the farmers, to the uh, agro processors, food processors, women as workers and laborers. So I think, um, this is what is very much needed when it comes to women, uh, women workers of the informal sector and um, food and nutrition security. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rima. Um, thank you for reminding us that when shocks occur, whether they're acute shocks like COVID or chronic shocks like climate, it's women who tend to be, um, tend to serve as the shock absorbers that everyone else relies on, whether they volunteer to do that or not. Uh, and therefore they need lots of uh, support, uh, financial, non-financial, uh, and moral support, but they also need support when it comes to the tasks of absorbing shocks. So I think the, the work you're doing is so important around organizing, empowering, uh, and promoting their ownership of women, of things like grain banks and seed banks. Uh, I think it's just so, so essential. As you say, it's not, uh, empowerment is not a zero sum game. If you empower women, you don't disempower men. If you empower women, you empower everybody. So 
uh, thank you so much for that, uh, Rima. I'm really uh, following on nicely from that, actually. Here we, I'm, well, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Kadija. Uh, Kadija, I'm, I'm probably mispronouncing your name, forgive me. Um, but welcome to the session. I hope you're in and you can hear me. Um, now, businesses are often seen as a problem when it comes to nutrition. Um, and I think people have in mind the big multinationals when they, when they talk about this, uh, businesses as a problem. But increasingly, the uh, vital role of small and medium enterprises, and indeed micro, small and medium enterprises, is being recognized. They're often called the quiet revolutionaries, trying to reshape food systems for those who are most vulnerable and at risk of malnutrition. What kind of support do SMEs need to do even more for nutrition? And how could the Nutrition for Growth Summit help? Over to you, Khadija. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Lawrence. Um, apologies, I joined late. I had some technical problems. Um, yes, thank you for the question. You have uh, phrased it wonderfully well. I, I like um, the emphasis on the role that um, SMEs play. Um, I think I, I agree with you 100%. SMEs play a critical role, especially the smaller the SME, the more important they are in terms of access to food, affordability of food, and also nutrition. Um, SMEs also take the largest amount of risks um, and do most of the heavy lifting in terms of ensuring that um, food gets to the poorest of the poorest in, in our society. Um, I think the, the most important thing for going forward for SMEs, in my view, is um, establishing networks and making sure that there is collaboration or at least platforms for collaboration between different SMEs that play different uh, critical roles in terms of ensuring food is accessible um, and, and making sure that there's visibility and awareness about um, in, with regards to the work that, that we do in relation uh, recognition of the role that we play. So even having this platform to talk about um, the work that we do is part of the, of the recognition that, that I am talking about. Um, it's also important to increase the resilience or the stability of SMEs, especially in durations of, of economic um, challenges. COVID is one example. For example, in Kenya, a lot of small businesses, the vendors that we work with, the, the food vendors, especially women food vendors, uh, COVID had a huge impact on their businesses and really decimated some, some of the um, businesses that took a long time for people to build. So increasing resilience and providing support um, uh, in terms of um, technical support, financial um, training, uh, access to capital, all these things play a critical role um, when, it, when, when, when shops happen. Um, the other thing that's really important for SMEs also is uh, lobbying and ability to influence government policies to recognize um, the, the critical um, role that SMEs play. So for example, in Kenya recently, the government had introduced a, quite a predatory taxation or law that really would have impacted food distributors and, and food, um, food vendors in particular. So this, what happened is that there was little awareness about the policies that are impacting food and distribution of food and access to food. So by the time the policies are being implemented, it's a bit too late for people to lobby and, and make a difference. So understanding some of the policies that are being put forward by governments and being aware of the impact that they will have on food is really critical for different uh, partners or players to, to be cognizant of. Uh, because for some of these things, once they take place to change them is quite difficult. So being involved, and for SMEs like ourselves, we're quite, uh, you know, we're running businesses. So we're on the ground, we're doing stuff that, um, selling goods, last mile distribution, quite challenging businesses. So to be aware of what's going on in the world of 
policies and decision makers, um, there, there needs to be a like a bridge that 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 um that supports us. Uh, for Kwanza Tukule, we particularly work with food vendors. Um, I know that fortification was discussed, and um, part of the roles that food vendors play is ensuring that fortified nutritious foods that come into the market that are new that people are not aware of. Um, food vendors are the platform that really creates the awareness and, and influence the taste of people and the choices that people make when it comes to food, especially in the low income areas. So the ensuring that um, products that come to the market that are nutritious, that um, are not known can be, um, can be made available or at least can be awareness can be created at the lower level so that uh, we as businesses can also play a role in influencing the adoption of new nutritious foods that are being piloted or implemented in, in different markets. Um, so I think that, that those, those would be my comments. I'll pause there, uh, Lawrence, and hand it over back to you. Thank you, Kadisha, and I uh, hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly or close to it. Is that right? Yeah. Um, Khadija, thank you for reminding us uh, about the key role that SMEs play. You said they take risks. Uh, they do a lot of the heavy lifting when it comes to getting food to the people who are most vulnerable. And they even, they even play a key role in, in, uh, in encouraging early adoption of new, more nutritious types of foods. But you also highlighted this, this paradox and they take the most risks, but they've got actually the the least ability to take risks when it comes in the face of shocks because they don't have vast amounts of operating capital to fall back on when things like COVID strike. So they need support. They need support in terms of networks. And I very much hope that um, that uh, that Kuanza Tukule is part of the Scaling Up Nutrition Business Network, which I know operates in Kenya, because the, the Sun Business Network is a really key platform to help uh, SMEs uh, collaborate and advocate and engage with governments to do the kind of lobbying you were talking about. Um, but it's also really important to give uh, SMEs technical and financial training and assistance and, and absolutely access to capital. They tend to be either too small for micro loans or too big, uh, sorry, too big for micro loans or too small for the formal sector. So um, thank you, uh, Kadisha, for giving us that insight into what it's like to be a managing director of an SME in Africa at this particular moment in time, trying to advance nutrition goals. Really, really insightful. Um, I now like to pass it to my final, uh, to the final speaker uh, for this session. And panelists, get ready for the next session because you, you, you're then going to have to deal with some Q&A from the floor. Um, but Tom, um, Tom Arnold, you've seen summits come and go over the years, Tom. Um, can I ask you to reflect on what you think is different about these two summits? And feel free, feel free to throw COP26 in as well. And how could, they've, they've clearly opened lots of doors and windows when it comes to nutrition, but how do we, how do we make the most of that? Over to you, Tom. Thanks, Lawrence. I think when you put the three together, and it is important to put the three together, uh, what one of the big changes is a change of mindset, an acceptance that the, cons the whole idea of a food system is the framework within which we have to think and we have to plan for the future. But that's at a, the, the, the risk of that is that it's at, still at a very general level. This, has, this thinking in food system terms has to be brought down into more practical terms. Uh, because the, the real question to answer here is, how do the, the links between the food agenda, the environmental agenda, and the health agenda, how do they connect together? And the answer to that is going to be different in every country. So that's a starting point, translating this important concept of food systems into practical policy terms. And then I think there are three elements here, what I'd call the three Ps, uh, which must be in place in order to achieve change. Politics, policies, and participation. Poli politics. 
uh, it is crucially important that the mo political momentum behind food systems is maintained into the future. And that's going to really require that uh, a couple of things. Firstly, I think clarity about what has emerged from these three summits. If I could put one practical recommendation, is, it is that January and February next year should be spent with people thinking about what the key outcomes have been and what are the key measures that they're going to try to take forward. That should be happening at governmental, civil society, and, and different levels. And the second thing is that to situate this into the wider context. I mean, if food and nutrition is to get it the attention it's going to need, it's competing with some very other big political priorities. COVID and the response to COVID and the building back from COVID. Uh, the whole question of climate and the whole question of, of conflict stroke migration. They are big political realities that we are operating with. And I think it's really important, and you've said this over and over again, Lawrence, that we have to integrate nutrition into these other big priorities. So that's the, that's the politics of it. I think the policy side of it is we've had many big commitments at the Food System Summit that countries are committed to food systems transformation. But how to work, how to chart that journey forward is of crucial importance. And the other big legacy of the past year is, and Sophie touched on it at the very beginning, the fact that so many different stakeholders are now part of the process. A food system to be transformed requires all the players in the food system to play their part. So the, the momentum that has been achieved in the past year about engagement with different stakeholders, that all has to be maintained into the future. So prioritization, clarity of thinking, and a reconfirmation of the political commitment uh, that we've had in the past year, that has to continue into the future. Thank you, Tom. Uh, great, great summary, uh, great roadmap for the rest of us. The mindsets have changed, but how to translate that changed mindset into uh, changed politics, changed policies, and changed participation. If we don't do that, we run the risk of what Farouk said of falling back into our silos and forgetting, as Sophie said, about the, the systems thinking. And uh, Tom, it's wise advice that all of us uh, individually in our organizations, whether public or private, and collectively in our existing alliances or new alliances that we're in, have to spend January and February thinking about what does this all mean? What does it all mean for what we do, what I'm going to do, what my partners are going to do? And it's very, it's got to be very tangible. What does it mean for our priorities, for our staff, for our boards, for our stakeholders, for our resourcing, uh, for our measurements? Or it's got to, we've got to translate all of this incredible energy into very practical, doable, implementable actions that will accelerate nutrition. That's what we all want to see. Um, Panelists, I'm going to now turn you over to the uh, next moderator. And our moderator is um, Mofian. Um, uh, Mofian on, on an, Onanuga. Sorry, Mofian. Mofian Onanuga, who's the co founder of President of the Girl Up London Coalition. Um, Mofian, over to you. You've got about uh, 20, 20 minutes. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Lawrence, and thank you to our amazing panelists for what has been such an engaging conversation so far. Now, whilst you've been speaking to us, our audience has been quite active in the chat. So what I'd like to do is pass over and translate what they've been talking about and ask our panelists a few questions. So let's have a quick look. I see Joseph Chekiebuje. He has mentioned how impressed he was by the initiatives that the UNFSS is putting in place to ensure food security. But he asks, what mechanism is being put in place to ensure the initiatives are fully embraced by all players in the food production chains? Now, panelists, I'd like to open this up to everyone. More than one person is allowed to answer. And please, the person who feels most compelled to answer this question, go first.
if it does help, I'm more than happy to pinpoint one person and then everyone can engage in conversation. If I can pass this over to you, Khadija, I was so compelled as you were speaking and I do feel that this is an important question. Yes, um, I think um, the implementation requires collaborated approach um, of different stakeholders. Um, in, in the beginning, we need a lot more awareness on the ground of um, the programs or projects um, for the partners that play um, like that are close to the end consumers. So awareness is important. Collaboration and networks are also important. Um, in addition, uh, policies also help uh, because businesses, at least from my experience, being an entrepreneur, compliance is, is really critical. So if there are ways in which um, some of the programs can be translated into um, um, regulations, or, or treaties or documents that can be signed that people can be held accountable for that will speed up the implementation or at least the adoption of um, different um, ideas or projects on the ground. Brilliant and I love how you mentioned collaboration you are so correct it's for us to all work together and when you have different hands and different minds from across the world the end result is much greater. Lawrence, can I pass this over to you? Do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, sorry to um, butt in on the, the panelists' discussion, but I think on the follow-up, I think the question was, how do, you know, it's, it's nice to have fine words at summits, but how do we know something's actually going to happen? I, I, think, um, I think a couple of things. First of all, each country has developed a national food system transformation pathway, and I think it's up to the stakeholders in those countries to look at those public documents and then hold their governments to account in different ways. Uh, there, there are many different ways of doing that. And I think the second thing to note is that lots of individual commitments were made at the UNFSS and will be made at the N4G. N4G has a, a very uh, powerful, because of the nature of the N4G commitments, uh, they, tend to, they tend to be more discreet and smart. There will be a very powerful follow-up mechanism uh, coordinated by the Global Nutrition Report. And then for the UNFSS, there's, a, there's an open register of commitments that have been made. And I think there will be lots of civil society mechanisms to track those commitments. GAIN made a set of very specific commitments. And I, as the leader of GAIN, I'm, I'm totally expecting someone to come to me in a year or two years or five years time and say, you said you were gonna do this, but you didn't do this. So what, you know, I, so I think, I think the, the, the evidence, the, the commitments are out there and now it's up to others to organize around holding people like me and Faroo, uh, in fact, all of the panelists uh, accountable. Back to you. If I can just follow up with that, Lawrence, because you said that you're expecting for people to come back to you with these questions. If you know already that there will be certain things inevitably that you as an organization aren't able to achieve, then why are the promises being made or why are these, even, these conversations even be, being brought to the table? Um, are there implementations that you have that you are going to try and work towards, or is it just an empty, in essence, an empty promise? Well, I think all the pro well, I can only speak for gain. Uh, the promises we make, we think we can make them. There are, there are, you always, always want to get the balance right between a stretch commitment and a commitment you feel that you're, um, you at least have a chance of making. So you don't want to make a commitment that you would have, you don't want to make a business as, as usual commitment. That's, that's worthless, but you don't want to make a commitment that is so ridiculously overambitious that it will only lead to disappointment and failure. So you have to strike the balance between those two extremes, it seems to me. And I think for game, we've, we've done that. I think that's excellent. If I can hand over to you, Dr. Agnes, I see your hand is raised. Would you like to add to this conversation? Thank you. Um, the reason I raised my hand is because I, I want to make sure that uh, we also have a good sense. It's not the place probably, that's why I hadn't mentioned it earlier, but since the question has come up, it's probably the time to tell uh, this audience that we have actually already uh, put in place from uh, uh, UN perspective, the Secretary has already put in place a follow-up mechanism, uh, the hub, which is going to be based at FAO next year, starting with January. And the sole purpose of the hub is to ensure two things that you talked about, you all kept talking about. 
that we coordinate right and maintain a food systems approach to what we are doing, uh, really ensuring that we are, we, are, we are not breaking back into silos, number one. Number two, that we have a follow-up mechanism. Remember from the Secretary General's statement that he committed to a follow-up mechanism every two years. So every two years, being able to, commit, to connect with the rest of the world and find those, uh, that follow-up and be able to report on that is extremely important. And there's provision, and this is extremely important, there's provision that besides member states and UN agencies, there's an, a mechanism of engaging uh, with the rest of the world, the rest of the world being civil society producers, youth, uh, people that necessarily wouldn't be uh, what uh, your typical engagement with member states and UN institutions. So uh, that there's a docking station <clears throat> within the hub that will ensure that indigenous people, youth, and all the communities that the Food System Summit has engaged in the past will be engaged. There's also a mechanism for ensuring that, that uh, there's a, an ecosystem of support that keeps looking at how do we sharpen what we deliver when it comes to some of the things that, uh, that the commitments that people are committing to delivering to. How do we learn? How do we share those with others? Uh, there will also be uh, a mechanism of, of engagement that will explain those, all those things. The hub starts 1st of January. And uh, yeah, so I just wanted to make sure that this community does understand that there's a planned, already planned uh, mechanism of follow up uh, from the Secretariat. Thank you again. And thank you for asking the question. Yeah, my pleasure. And thank you so much. I'm now going to pose another question to our panelists. And this question comes from Gabriel Tuol. Gabriel asks that how and when will we finally decide ourselves to build an IPCC for food systems as we continue to discuss the role of science and we have been talking about it again and again. If I can first throw this question over to Dr. Faru Lemma. Yeah, thank you. I, I, as far as I understood the IPC is uh, in terms of I didn't get the question, sorry. No, that's okay. I'm more than happy to repeat the question. So Gabriel asks, when will we finally decide ourselves to build an IPCC for food systems? So what does IPCC stand for? So this is, a, this is I suppose, a, a construct within science that is yet to be built for the food systems. And as mm. I am not 100% versed on this, I believe it's best that we go to Dr. Agnes yeah. to break it down for both of us. Yeah. I'm just as sorry. interested, and I would love to I'm find sorry. the answer to get your question. No, that's completely fine. Dr. Agnes, please enlighten us both. No, thank you so much. <clears throat> and again, uh, these are all, the, the system is full of so much jargon that sometimes it's very difficult to understand. <clears throat> so the IPCC stands for Intergovernmental um, uh, uh, Panel, something on climate and uh, climate change. <laughs> so what it does is really uh, talk to engage on a lot of uh, engage with the scientific community and ensure that there's a, a first uh, a cutting edge science on climate change issues, but also provide guidance and leadership. Now, uh, from a food system perspective or food perspective. The Committee on Food Security was put up under um, the UN, the, under the three RBAs uh, with a uh, high level panel of experts to support that uh, from a food perspective. That committee has been doing a whole lot of work with working with governments really equivalent to what you, to, and not equivalent, really doing intergovernmental work trying to understand how uh, a lot of this uh, that, that, that is put to the forefront. Now, uh, does it need strengthening? Does it need engaging a whole lot of more scientists? Um, in fact, Gabriel will be talking to us about it <clears throat> as, he, as he comes towards the, the end of this session. Uh, that conversation has happened many times, but definitely the whole idea of ensuring that enough science behind what we do in the food sector and now in the food systems is what the CFS and it's different uh, and it's high level group of experts, panel of experts does. And I, again, we'll be hearing more about that. Uh, but again, the biggest, what, what I had coming from the Food System Summit was let's strengthen what exists rather than creating new mechanisms. That's what I had. And uh, that's what uh, the UN Food System, uh, I mean, the Secretary General system is going to be doing because 
uh, that was really the, the general feeling of governments coming out of, uh, of the summit that they needed to, we need to strengthen more of what CFS and its high level experts, what, what they do uh, to ensure that uh, it's more, it's moving towards uh, what we see coming out of the IPCC. Thank you. Thank you so much. And one thing I love about all of these conversations is someone who's not directly been working in the food space comes out with more knowledge and I'm glad that I've just gained that. So thank you so much, Dr. Agnes. I see a hand from you, Sophie, and I would also like to get your opinion on this, Tom. So while Sophie's answering, if you can please start thinking about what you have to offer to this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I, I think this is a, a really personal opinion, but the IPCC doesn't create research, it doesn't create data, but it collects research and data. And it collects research and data that is um, neutral and that a lot of scientists agree on. I think right now in the food space, as Dr. Agnes Kalabata mentioned, we need to strengthen that science and data. That science and data isn't always conclusive and isn't always um, shared in a neutral space between scientists and, and policy creators. So I think that's, that's a gap for the food system space, um, especially when it, it, you create a conversation about creating an IPCC um, around food systems. I don't think we're just there just yet, unfortunately. And I'd be happy to happy to join that, that conversation. Uh, Sophie has summarized that very well. Um, I'm actually involved in chairing a, a committee for the European Commission, which is looking at these issues. Uh, I mean, the whole point is that if we are to have well-informed food policy, we have to bring good science, good data uh, to helping frame policies. That's at the heart of it. Uh, Agnes is very correct in saying that we have to build on what we have. And so at national level, there are many countries that have uh, already systems in place to link science to policies. But in many cases, that's not strong enough. And that's, I think, one of the outcomes of the summit and the nutrition for growth. We have to commit to more stronger links between uh, policy, between science and policies. And that means strengthening institutions as well. That's of great importance. Thank you so much, Tom. Now I'm gonna pass over to Dr. Tanya, but onto the point of both yours, Tom and Sophie. As a STEMinist, which is someone who is, I suppose, very, very, someone who's very reliant on the facts and someone who appreciates the facts and the data, science is, I suppose, our biggest and our most best friend in this instance. And we do have to listen to the data and use it to our advantage and act on it as soon as we receive it. So thank you so much. If I can pass on to you now. Yeah, so I just wanted to add, uh, I, I truly believe in the role of science and, and technology to, to, to sort out many of these issues. But I think um, when I was like sharing all this paper of jurisdictions of knowledge and something that we're trying to do uh, from the Global Hub of Indigenous People's Food Systems is also like to say, there are different ways of providing evidence. Um, and I, I wish that there could be more openness to also take other ways of, of knowledge that are crucial. And that's when we like make this argument that indigenous peoples and their knowledge are game changers, not only for food systems, but for climate change and many of the challenges that we're facing that we need to learn more from all these different ways of making knowledge. Thank you so, so much. I am now going to go on to our final question, which is again, open to all of our panelists. And this question comes from Windy Kartika. She asks, how important is the youth's perspective on local food needed to build a food system, especially the consumption aspect, and how to analyze the resilience of a region's food system? If I may, Sophie, I'd like to ask that you help us out with this question. Short answer, it's really important. <laughs> um, young people are at the front line, um, no matter where they are in the world. They're young agriculturalists, they're young entrepreneurs, and they're the largest consumer population the world has ever seen. Um, and the power of youth is sometimes um, ignored or seen as lesser to other constituencies um, value and stakeholder contribution. Um, young people walk out of school no matter where they are in the world and they're faced with uh, fast food adverts and they're faced with fast food adverts on their phones, on their computers and sometimes even in schools. Um, and the 
the money needs to be put in to young people and young people's futures when it comes to healthy school meals, when it comes to the media's contribution to what young people eat. Um, and it also needs to be put into education, education on food, no matter where they are in the world. Um, malnutrition is not just a global south issue, it's a global north issue as well, and all young people around the world are facing it at such a high level. Um, youth entrepreneurs in the agri-food industry play such a crucial role in evolving um, the sector and the system into new ways of thinking, uh, producing, consuming, um, and, and selling food. And I, I'd really like to hear from uh, Khadija from the front line on, on what she's noticed as well in terms of youth entrepreneurship and, and agripreneurship as well. I don't want to take your job over, but I'd but, um, be really interested to hear if that's okay. Uh, you're right, I would love to as well. Could you please do add your input here? Khadija, we would love to hear what you have to say. I'm hoping we haven't lost you. And if so, panelists, you're more than welcome to add your input. Dr. Can I jump in? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, because I just I, I agree with all what Sophie has said, and I was mentioning interculturality. I think from a perspective of indigenous peoples, what we say with the loss of our culture in our, our languages, there are some numbers that say like every two weeks a language is lost. A language is lost, and for us, orality plays such a crucial role that it will lose those languages, and that's why we like reinforce interculturality. You see many efforts, for example, in the U.S. and in Canada where many native peoples are a native nations are a, reclaiming their food systems because they believe there was like a lot of nutritious value. Someone was asking about the underutilized crops. We say that we have 20 major crops in the world that uh, uh, provide the 90% of the calorie intake. And we focus mainly on three of these major crops, but what are the rest? A lot of this has been lost when we portray these interventions and we don't consider these lenses of interculturality. And I think when we talk about interculturality it's the future also of the children and the next generations. And that's what they need to be at the front line. And we need them a, to, to offer them a future too. I must admit that was my favorite question. And I love how you both tied in the fact that we must educate and we must empower the youth so that they know that they are, I suppose, a target audience for malnutrition and for bad food and for all of these fast food adverts. And we have to make sure that they are able to see through that, that we are able to implement ways to avoid this within our schools and our communities. And on your point on indigenous people, Dr. Tanya, that we have to make sure that we don't let the stories or the livelihoods of the way that people are living die down so that nothing is lost. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much to all of our panelists for adding your input to this conversation. Thank you so, so much for it being really informative and interactive. I wish now that we had more time, but I will be handing back to you, Dr. Lawrence, to please continue. Thank you so, so much. Thanks, Mofin. Um, and, and colleagues, thanks for the great questions. Thanks for the great answers. And thanks for the great moderation, Mofin. We're an and audience. We're trying hard to answer as many of your questions as we can in the Q&A box. So keep looking at that. Um, we now come to the final segment of our session today, of our session today. And we're very excited to have with us um, Dr. Gabriel Ferraro. And Gabriel is the, he's, the he's the chair of the Committee on World Food Security. And he's joining us to give some final remarks as we move forward. Dr. Ferraro, a pleasure to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Lawrence, and the pleasure is mine. Uh, and to all dear participants and colleagues, uh, allow me first to thank uh, Agnes uh, Kalibata and her team for organizing such an impressive event in view of the Tokyo Nutrition for Growth Summit and for giving me the opportunity of providing this concluding remarks with the chair of the Committee on World Food Security. Uh, well, this has been an extraordinarily rich uh, panel. I commend all of you, all the speakers, and panelists for such a thoughtful uh, uh, words. Well, summing up, allow me to share some takeaways, uh, Logan. So my first one 
is that uh, especially after the Food System Summit, the global, the national, the local communities are really better understanding that food systems, diets and nutrition are interconnected and understanding the ways in which they are. Uh, well, the CDC is one, we all share uh, that this is why the systems approach to malnutrition is the only effective way to tackle it. And this includes systems thinking as well as putting systems thinking into action. We need to tackle malnutrition as an essential element of universal health access, but we also need to tackle malnutrition as an essential element of education systems, having schools as a vector of access to nutritious food, but also mainstreaming education for nutrition and healthy diets within our education programs. We also, we also need empowerment of women as a key driver uh, of equitable access uh, to resources and to nutritious food. And of course, we need nutrition sensitive uh, agricultural policies. But at the same time, and precisely by putting adequate nutrition and healthy diets together with the empowerment of women, family farmers, with the support to small and medium enterprises, to decent work, putting decent work at the center of agriculture, we may trigger systemic changes that leads us to food systems that also provide decent jobs and incomes to farmers food producers and free rural dealers, and help cap capture carbon, reverse biodiversity loss, and restore ecosystems. My second uh, takeaway is that true and meaningful transformation of our food systems can only happen through the genuine collaboration by all actors, including those that we don't fully agree with. Foremost, food systems can no longer be a preserve of a single government, ministry, or department, or even of a single constituency. Systems action needs adequate networks to operate. It needs platforms where our actors and networks can connect. And this applies to the community and the local levels, to cities and rural urban territories, to the national and the global levels. Systems action needs shared visions, principles, and agreed lines of action. And this is precisely the mission of the committee on world food security at the global level. We, as a committee, we are an intergovernmental body of the UN uh, that connects uh, 133 member states of the United Nations together with civil society, with the private sector, with indigenous peoples and farmer organizations, with the philanthropic community, the CGAIAR, the international financial institutions, the United Nations development systems, including WFP, FAO, IFAD, UN Nutrition, WHO, to address uh, at the committee complex and commonly contentious issues that are key to adequate nutrition and achieving SDG through, through sustainable and inclusive food systems. At the global level, the CFS, as Agnes mentioned, provides uh, this platform uh, operating under the principles of inclusion, country leadership, and science and evidence base uh, through the high-level panel of, of experts of the committee providing a science policy or even more a knowledge governance interface. In this way, uh, we developed uh, since 2009 multiple agreements, global agreements, that uh, received the support of all the stakeholders on issues such as uh, responsible governance of natural resources and land, on the ways in which uh, the business community can res responsibly invest in agriculture, on climate change, on water management, on connecting and empowering smallholders to markets, just to name a few. And in this way in the, of working, this year, uh, this last year, we developed voluntary guidelines on food systems and nutrition, on policy recommendations on agroecology and other innovative approaches. And we are already at, the, at this global level uh, focusing on uh, adopting common guidelines on gender equality, policy recommendations on youth engagement, and addressing the impact of inequalities in uh, the access to nutritious uh, food. My third takeaway is that we must ensure that all existing initiatives, platforms, and mechanisms on food systems are connected. And the Nutrition for Growth Summit is in this way adding efforts to the Food System Summit and the COP26. 
Now we may have to look at the existing structures, as Agnes also referred to, that are already in place and that can help us define what needs to be done. And this is where the committee and the high-level panel of experts that was referred by some speakers offer an inclusive platform at the global level to connect countries with the wider food systems community as a public space in which countries developing and developed alike showcase and review their progress and connect with the financing for development and the community of that provides means of implementation also with civil society and other stakeholders. I hope that the committee may serve as the global platform at the global level obviously where coalitions coming from the summit where initiatives alliances as well as the national pathways uh, led by countries may find the space to connect to come together, to share lessons, to increase accountability, to gathering national governments with the UN system and with all stakeholders. Concluding, uh, Lawrence, uh, Tom Arnold referred to the need of making the right politics and policies work for the deep transformations we are fostering. So let us put our hands and our brains into action and make it uh, happen. Uh, thank you, Lawrence, over to you. Gabriel, thank you so much. Um, I want to, that was that was lovely and insightful. I want to pick up on your theme, which I think you was a big theme of your speech, was connection. Um, that's what this, this session is all about. It's about connecting the UN Food System Summit with COP26, with the Nutrition for Growth um, Summit. And uh, just a reflection over the, my work with Agnes and others over the past year or two is we must resist fragmentation. We must resist binary thinking. We, we need food and health and environment, as one of the people in the questions noted. We need plants and animal foods. We need public and private sectors. We need youth and indigenous people and the establishment. We need women and men. We need regulations and incentives. We need urban and rural. We're in a fight. Uh, we're in a fight and we need all the allies we can get. And that's what systems thinking and critically systems action is all about. Uh, no one has a monopoly on malnutrition and no one has a monopoly on the solutions to malnutrition. Uh, we all have to work together, channel the outrage and end malnutrition for good. Thank you everyone. Thank you panelists. Thank you audience. Thank you organizers. Thank you uh, Agnes. Thank you government of Japan. Great session and uh, look forward to fantastic summit tomorrow. Have a good day everybody. Hunger is on the rise and malnutrition continues to stunt our children. Lack of access to healthy foods is straining our medical systems and cutting lives short. But together we can change that. The UN Food Systems Summit is working towards a world in which all people are healthy and nourished. So how do we get there? We worked with thousands of people from across the globe to identify promising solutions. Solutions backed by evidence that have the power to transform. Now it's time to act. We can support our family farmers, fishers, and livestock owners in increasing their produce while using less resources. We can expand our social systems to protect people from hunger, food insecurity, and malnutrition. We can scale up the production and sale of crops that are more resilient and nutritious. We can use the latest innovations empower farmers in new ways where through precision agriculture, clean energy, powered irrigation, or We can develop a global food security index that will improve food safety. And we can teach people about the value of good nutrition and help them access it. We have a long way to go, but these solutions and others like them have the power to deliver the future we want. A future where all people are healthy and nourished.